Welcome to a new edition of the brand called You. Today I have with me a very, very accomplished millennial from the corporate world who's flown down from Cincinnati, USA to be with us. Ashwin Garg, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Ashwin uh, is an associate director with Procter & Gamble in Cincinnati. He has studied at McGill. Uh, he was at United World College in British Columbia and he was at Basant Valley School. So Ashwin, tell me a little bit about your early life and what made you select going off to British Columbia? Yeah, so I mean, spent most of my childhood in a mix of Singapore and Delhi. And honestly, it was a little bit of a freak chance. I think when I was 15, I just applied because all the smarter kids in my uh, class were applying and I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, that I wanted to go, how it, it would all work, to be honest. And, you know, applied, got through one stage, got through the second stage and finally, I remember when the offer came, just like, is it the right decision to, to go away from home as a 15 year old, go to a boarding school? But, you know, it's a, it's an incredible opportunity. I was really fortunate to, mm. to get to spend two years with 200 people from 60 plus countries uh, and just, you know, learn uh, through cultural uh, climatization, just spend time with lots of different people and obviously had some fantastic teachers and a good opportunity. So uh, look, looking back, it, it's a bit odd how it happened, but really fortunate that it did. Wonderful. And what was it like to leave home at 15? I mean, how did, uh, at such a young age, what, what, what were the changes you saw in your own life? Yeah, I mean, I think it's tough. I was one of the, I think among my peer group, I was one of the few people who did leave that early. I was also a little bit young by Pearson College's standards. Many of the other students there were 16, 17, some were even 18. Um, I think it shapes your thinking very early. And it's hard, you know, there's no A-B testing. There's no way to go back and say, if I hadn't gone, this is exactly who I would have been or how I would have been differently. But they're just, like I mentioned earlier, the amount of learning you get from being, you know, exposed to so many people from so many different parts of the world, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different ways of thinking. I think it, it shaped me to become a, a different person to who I would have, been, would have been. And I'm, like I said, I'm very fortunate to have had that experience. Mm -hmm. So after Pearson, you moved to McGill. I did, yeah. And then you joined Procter & Gamble yeah. in Canada. Yes. Why this love for Canada? I mean, so three different provinces I lived in. One was on the West Coast in British Columbia, then in Montreal, which is Quebec, and then in Toronto, which is Ontario, uh, which is actually more than most of my Canadian friends, you know, who were born and raised there have lived in. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great country. It's what, you know, I, I now basically call home. It's, a, you know, it's just been a, the right balance for me between the, the being a developed country, but also, you know, politically lines up with where, where I am, where I want to be, what it, you know, what it does from a society standpoint. And it's just been a very welcoming home for me. And so when, you know, when I got, when I graduated from Montreal, uh, the most likely place for me to get a job was going to be in Canada just for work visa and permit, things like that. And, you know, the rest is history. After that, I stayed there uh, nine years in Toronto before moving to the U.S. where I am now. Wonderful. So let's talk about Procter & Gamble. Yeah. You know, you joined uh, the company when you were just 20. Just, just yeah, almost 21. Yeah. You know, uh, and, uh, you know, you moved from one role into another role. What was it like to start working at 20? You know, it's a little bit of, you're not really sure 100% what you're doing. I wasn't, you know, it's funny now when I interview young candidates, a lot of them say it's been my dream to join Procter & Gamble. I've been wanting to do this since I was in middle school. And I want to do marketing. I want to work in consumer goods. And I don't know if that was the case for me. You know, when companies came to our campus, I applied to many, many different companies across many different industries. I, didn't, I did a variety of internships. None of them was at P&G. And so it just came down to, you know, it was a good offer I got. It seemed like the culture was the right fit for me. And, you know, then I, I joined and I just had to... You know, I didn't study business. Mm -hmm. I studied economics, math, and computer science. I didn't actually study marketing, which is what mm -hmm. I do now. But I think what, if you learn, if you have the strong enough fundamentals, you learn as you go. And it was a lot of, it was a very, very steep learning curve early on, but I would have managed to adapt. Quite amazing. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions on the kind of role that you're doing. Yeah. But before that, you know, you're one of the few people I know yeah. who has stayed with one company yeah. for 11 years. Yeah. I mean, most people of your age yeah. just believe the faster they change jobs, the faster they move ahead. Yeah. Um, what has made you stay with PNG for so many years? Yeah, it, it's interesting. In the introduction, you said millennial. I think I'm just on the high end of the millennial okay. scale. But um, it is true. I think m almost everybody else I know, the vast majority have moved call it every three to five years. And that seems to be the new normal. I think 20, 30 years ago, people prided themselves on staying at one organization for 30 years. 
And now people pride themselves on jumping around. I think what made me stay is is sort of two things. One is I've constantly kept learning. Mm-hmm. Uh, as soon as I started to, to plateau in my learning, I got moved to a different role, new challenge, different part of the business. I mean, it's a huge business with you know over $25 billion brand. So the opportunity to do different things within one organization exists. Mm-hmm. And, and the second is, you know, it's a culture, the culture of the company, the people I'm around, whether it's my leaders, my peers, my team, uh, are people I'm proud to go to work with every day. I'm excited to wake up and go to work in the morning. So I think, you know, if, if that fades, then you you make a different life decision. But I've been fortunate that in 11 years, it's, uh, it's stayed up there. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. And you moved from Toronto to uh, Cincinnati yeah. two years ago. Yeah. Into a very different role. Yes. Um, are you free to talk a little bit about your role there? Yeah. So big picture, the way the company is structured is our headquarters um, do basically end-to-end work. So everything from you know, product creation, the packaging, to TV, et cetera, TV co- co- advertising design and all that. And then our regional markets are more executional. Mm-hmm. So you could, you're more focused on in-market planning, selling, and those sorts of things. So our, Canada's, you know, our, our regional is a, its own region uh, within North America. And all of our North American headquarter work happens out of Cincinnati. So after nine years, you know, I've done a lot of the different types of roles I could do within uh, being a business, a brand or marketing leader within Canada. Uh, and so after a point, you know, moving to the U.S. allowed me to do more future planning, innovation work, anything that was, you know, more product design related and working with our multifunctional partners like product supply, mm-hmm. research and development. And so very different to the type of opportunity I would have gotten had I stayed in Canada. Mm-hmm. Uh, but again, great learning. So it's, it keeps me on my toes and forces me to, to keep learning and developing my skills. Wonderful. And I was reading somewhere that you were involved with uh, the Super Bowl ad of PNG, which apparently has been the most watched uh, ad, ad in the history of... Uh, it's been one-off. I'm not sure I can 100% claim it's been the most watched. Okay. But it's been a, you know, it was an amazing opportunity. PNG corporately this past uh, January mm-hmm. created a the first ever interactive Super Bowl commercial where consumers got to, to take part in the commercial experience, basically watch the commercial and choose, choose their own ending, choose their own adventure. And it was an amazing opportunity. Mm-hmm. So... Just got to you know work with lots of different celebrities, different agency partners, lots of leaders within PNG, and uh, yeah, you know we were fortunate to got uh, lots of positive uh, conversation in the press, and just you know for a brand builder, the Super Bowl is probably in the U.S. is probably the pinnacle of what you want to do. So I hope to be able to do it again. So, question for you then, you know, when you build such a successful commercial, what goes into making a good commercial? So the uh, the reason I enjoy brand building and it's you know, and yeah, the reason I've stayed in what I'm what I've stayed in for so long is it's the, the it's partly a science, but so much of it is an art. Mm-hmm. And so over you know my career, I've seen so many commercials that we built that checked all the boxes. They had exactly the things that go into a good commercial. You showed it to a few consumers, you tested it, it tested really well, you got a great score, and then you air it on on television or nationally, and it bombs. It just completely failed. Mm-hmm. And the opposite has happened too, where something is a little bit edgy, a little different, you don't expect it to do well. And it does really well. So it's very, very difficult to articulate. And that's why I love the challenge, because it's not just a science. It's not a formula-based thing that you figure out what it takes to build a commercial and you build it. There's an art to it. There's a you know a little bit of it needs to tug at the consumer's heartstrings a little or appeal emotionally while driving a product benefit and then giving the consumer a, a reason to believe that your, your product or your brand is the best to mm-hmm. serve that. Very interesting. So I'm going to move to the next segment. Yeah. Um, Let's talk about your podcast. Yeah, you know, uh, Edges and Sledges. Yeah. Uh, with your two other co-founders, you run, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the number one rated cricket podcast in the world. It's number Indian one in cricket. most countries. In most, so countries. I think it's number one in now in the U.S., Canada, India. I think in aggregate, there's. I think it's Australia as a market we still have to okay. track. But yeah, it's, we're fortunate it's okay. number one in most. Countries. So you know. Uh, my first question is that uh, who are your other two partners and uh, what has made you so passionate about the game? Yeah, I, th- I think great question. So I hosted with uh, my brother Varun and uh, a friend of ours from school, whose name is Dhananjay, we go, he goes by DJ. And so the three of us have been hosting at the time of us recording this episode, we have over 100 episodes of our podcast wow. already. We just celebrated our two year anniversary. So to, to answer your question on what made me so passionate or us so passionate about the game, you know, it's, it's, it's a great sport. We all love cricket. India, in general, is a cricket crazy country. But, you know, for me, having moved 
to India when for, for the you know as for the first time as a child when I think I was around about eight. Um, I remember sitting with uh, my brother Varun and my grandma and watching and learning what cricket was. Mm-hmm. Right. So despite being Indian, didn't really know much about the game. So in 1996, during the World Cup, learned what the game was. And then, you know, it was a good way of, you know, connecting with, with my grandmother at the time. And then at 15, like you said, I left home and I moved to Canada where there isn't much cricket player. And it became my way of not just staying in touch with, with home, with the culture, but also with my brother. And so over the last 15 years since I moved away from home, it's a, it's a thread that kind of ties us together. We now travel as much as we can to watch cricket together. We talk about the games. And, you know, over the last two years, that became and manifested in the Edges and Sledges, mm-hmm. which is our podcast. But it just, you know, it became very personal for me. And that's what kept me attached to the game, even though I have to wake up at four in the morning to watch them sometime or start watching games at 11 p.m. because mm-hmm. of time zone differences. That's fascinating. So, you know, you mentioned that you've traveled all over the world. Uh, to watch cricket. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about what you saw recently and what's coming up next. Yeah. So the most our most recent trip was England for the the World Cup in 2019 in mm-hmm. the summer. You know, obviously as India fans, we hope that result went a little bit better. Uh, but semi finals are great, and it was a great World Cup for India. So that was the last one. Our next trip, you know, assuming travel and things are all 100 percent back to normal, is scheduled to be Australia in October November of 2020, which will be the the T20 World. So again, very excited to be able to travel, uses it as an opportunity to vacation as well, but you know, watch the sport that we love as well. Amazing. And uh, does the cricketing fraternity, I'm saying, more from the sports people and the people who run the game, yeah. uh, how much are they willing to support edges and sledges? You know, it's been surprising. We've been very, very surprised by how much support there is. You know, we, we market ourselves as a fan run podcast. None of us do this full time. None of us are cricket journalists. None of us are trained in either sports or journalism or the combination. And yet, you know, we've been we've had multiple former cricketers on the show from uh, you know from India, uh, current cricketers from India, as well as uh, you know from Zimbabwe, from the West Indies. So it's been pretty amazing how they've embraced us because it's an authentic voice. I think we provide that's an experience the fan goes through, and that's why you know we're very fortunate to have lots of loyal listeners who tune in every week, and the cricket fraternity has got behind us. Mm-hmm. And if I remember, you know, your initial set of podcasts yes. were video. Yes. And then you switched completely to audio. We did. Yeah. What was the reason? I think, again, there was sort of two reasons. One was just selfishly for us. There was a logistics reason, right? We hosted from three different cities in three different continents. I'm in Cincinnati, DJ's in London, and Laura was in Singapore. So the logistics of trying to manage, uh, you know, video, and it, it really was just the three of our faces. On video, but probably the bigger reason is about two years ago is when we realized the podcasting and the audio only market outside of North America, basically in Europe, Asia, etc., was right on the upswing. Mm-hmm. People were just starting to embrace it. You know, YouTube and video had been huge in uh, in India, for example, for a while, but there wasn't much happening in the audio space. So one of the reasons we've been lucky enough to, to grow and be number one is because we were first, probably first movers. Mm. Uh, and we just realized there's this audio market for the person commuting, driving to work, listening to, who has headphones in on the train, or even you know at their work day on the weekends that are do, is doing something else with their eyes and their hands, but wants, some, wants you know uh, a message or something playing in their ears. Mm. And we were just able to tap into that. So it was, the, it was an early pivot we made from going to video to audio only, but I believe it was the right one. Fantastic. And where do you hope to see Edges and Sledges in the next uh, couple of years? I, I mean, our goal is to keep growing it as organically as possible, keep getting new guests, you know, and even in the upcoming season, we have lots of great guests lined up already. So keep talking to people, learning, expanding our footprint. We've now been asked to guest on other shows as well across the globe. So our goal is to you know keep growing it organically and hopefully just drive the listener base and maintain that number one spot. Fantastic. And in a cricket crazy country like India, yeah. have you ever considered uh, another language uh, podcast? Yeah, we, we talked about it. I think the three of us are probably most comfortable in English. Our English discussion, because most of our listener base is Indian as well, becomes uh, becomes a little bit of English. There'll be some Hindi words thrown in there, but we made the choice just for the most global appeal. And again, a lot of our audience, because it mirrors uh, us as well, a lot of our audience is the NRI community in the US, in the UK, in Australia, et cetera, who are Indians abroad, who are looking to stay in touch with their country and their sport. So that's been working for us. So for now, the focus is to stay on English. Wonderful. So let's move on to some of your other interests. You're an accomplished musician. 
and you play the tabla, the piano, the guitar, and probably not all. Uh, and I, you also, I also understand that you have your own jamming sessions in Cincinnati. I do, yeah. Uh, when did your interest for music start? It's a good question. I think when I was very, very young, so I don't remember this, but this is more stories that I've heard over the years. Um, you know, I just, I think I just saw a keyboard at a cousin's house or something and started started playing it and playing tunes. And at that point is when my mom said, hey, you know, there's obviously something here. He likes music, he's interested in it and has the ability. And so that's when at a pretty young age, I got into piano lessons and started learning the piano. And then when I when we moved back from Singapore to, to India, I think when I was nine or 10 is when I first really, for the first time in my uh, memory of my life, I saw the, this instrument called the tabla, which I'd never really seen before, never really heard. And I saw somebody very good at school playing it. And I distinctly remember going home that day from school and telling my mom, I want to learn how to play that. Mm. And so I continued my, you know, learning piano on the side, but that's when I made a bigger pivot to, to focus on percussion. And, you know, 20 years later, I'm still playing percussion in various forms with the tabla being my main instrument. So you play multiple percussion instruments? Yeah, I've, you know, I've played the drum set in a band and I played a, a couple of different hand drums depending on the opportunity. So I think the tabla is such a versatile instrument that once you learn it, it makes it relatively easier to learn other percussions. So now, you know, as a high schooler, I wanted to, I, I wanted to have that dream of being in a band. Uh, and so I learned the drums uh, to be able to do that. Wonderful. And any favorite instrument? Um, I'd say my favorite instrument, obviously, to play is the tabla. I'm a big fan of tabla. One I don't play that I don't know how to play that I would love to learn someday is the saxophone. Wow. When it comes to jazz, it's a, just a fantastic instrument. Amazing. Yeah. And um, how much time do you practice? It, probably not enough. I do think it's important though, like as you as you become an adult and as you invest in work life and jobs that can be high stress and hectic, that you make time to practice. So a lot of people ask me this, is how do you get time you know, with your hectic career to, to practice? And I said, you have to make it a priority. And right? not just practice, but to go out and play, go out and play music uh, with other musicians. You have to find the time to invest. And you know, I'm fortunate that PMG uh, really values this, but it's important. Work-life balance and finding things outside of your career or your day job to me are very important. Mm. And so, just making the priority to spend time on the podcast, to spend time with my music, I think make me a better uh, leader and an employee for PMG as well. And one last question on music yeah. before I move on is, uh, you know, I understand you go and perform with some friends yeah. uh, in, in your free time at night. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, again, and what it does for you. Yeah, I, I, there's, there's, it's an incredible experience to, to be able to play in front of people. It, for you know, when there's stakes, which means not you're not just playing at home in your garage or your basement. When there's stakes, which is you have to perform in front of people, uh, and there's going to be eyeballs on you. You practice that much harder. It pushes you that much more. So again, this is not full time for me. I'm not a professional musician or anything, but I, I have some professional guitarists now who in Cincinnati I play with. And you know when they invite me to come perform with them at a gig, you have to you know up your game a little bit, and it forces you to to you know get more focused, to practice harder, and up your level. And you know for anybody who's been on stage, whether it's an actor, a musician, stand-up comedian, etc., that the the thrill of being on a stage, performing at your best, delivering a great end product, and hearing the the audience applaud is is un unmatched. So it's just a it's a great experience that I hope to keep doing more of. One more question before I move to uh, some personal questions yeah. for you, you know. In PNG, yeah. you've not felt the need to do an MBA? I haven't yet. You know, I think about five years ago, I'm you know, when I was six, seven years in the company is when I would have had to make the call to do an MBA. Mm -hmm. I remember at the time speaking to lots of my managers, leaders, etc. And ultimately, I'm now at the point in my career where I believe that, you know, 11, 11 and a half years at PNG, leading, you know, diverse, large teams set me up better than an MBA would. Mm -hmm. I think had I five years in wanted to jump industries, move from consumer goods to finance or something else, that would have been the right opportunity to do it. You know, today, I'm not sure I'll learn as much more from an MBA or the networking, et cetera, will help me uh, more versus my time in PG. So that's been the decision for now. Uh, again, hard to say whether it's going to be the right one, but that was the reason for that. Okay. Yeah. So Ashwin, a few questions for you personally now. Yeah. Um, you know, 11 years experience with PNG, yeah. uh, education in Canada, in India, in Singapore. Over the last three decades of your life, have you had any people who have had an influence on you? And if so, what have you learned from them? Yeah, it's a great question. So, I mean, aside from my, my family, my parents and my brother, the one name that, that comes up is 
is actually a teacher of mine at Pearson College so in grade 11. Uh, you know, I went into grade 11 all ready to pursue a career in the sciences. I'd always been passionate about physics. I wanted to study engineering. So it was, it was all set in my mind that I wanted to pursue physics, chemistry, math, and study the sciences. And I had to choose a social study, just the way the curriculum was structured. And I said, do you want to choose history, geography, et cetera? And I chose economics. And I remember in my first two weeks of my economics class, my teacher at the time, his name is Peter Gardner, changed my worldview entirely. Just his approach to the balance between micro and macroeconomics and how, you know, similar to what I mentioned in brand building, economics is, some, in some universities, it's taught as science, in some it's taught as arts. It's this, this odd balance of trying to predict consumer behavior and consumers are fundamentally irrational. Mm-hmm. And so that's where, you know, really within, I want to say six or eight weeks of my life in the first little bit of grade 11, thanks to Peter, uh, I pivoted in a big way. I continued studying science in high school, but I knew that I wanted to go to college and study mm-hmm. uh, economics. Okay. And you know, now I work in brand building, nothing to do with the sciences or technical. So that was a big change in my life and very heavily influenced. So I was fortunate to have such a, such a great economics teacher that brought that up. Wonderful. So what would be three words that define Ashwin? It's a, it's a big question. I think from, you know, probably Ashwin at work, mm-hmm. I'd say the three words for me as a, in my career are uh, balanced, mm-hmm. I, I'd say optimistic, and I'd say probably, uh, probably leader or leadership. Okay. Those are the three things that often come, back, come up in feedback. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. So my next question is that if you were a role model to millions of children, and these children closely followed you and your life choices. Yeah. Uh, what would you change in yourself? Yeah, another another big question. I think one of the things I would I would change about myself is <clears throat> probably to be a little bit less focused on trying to be a hundred percent perfect at a hundred percent of things okay. that you do because okay. it's just physically impossible. Mm-hmm. And so learning. You know, learning to say, "Hey, you're you're not going to be the best at everything. You're going to be the you should try to be the best at a few things, mm-hmm. and rely on others to to add value in different ways." That's what I would probably do. So probably earlier in my life, try to get more focused on what uh, what I want to really succeed at, and you know, be okay letting go of things that I'm not going to focus on. Amazing. My next question is that: What is the most outrageous thing that you've ever done, and do you look look back at it with pleasure or regret? That's a good question. Thank you for sending this in advance because I had a little bit of time to think about this one. Um, you know, we were talking a little bit about music and I don't know if I've ever told the story on, on tape before, but when I was in, in grade 11 at, at boarding school, you know, I played a little, I played the piano and I played percussion, I played the tabla. And I remember just at the time it was important to me, I wanted to be part of some part of something in the music. Phase. I wanted to be part of a band. Mm-hmm. And I remember they had a, a great guitarist, a great piano player and a great drummer. And somebody at the time said, we're, we're just missing a bass guitar player. He said, we don't know how to play bass. Mm-hmm. I didn't know what a bass was. I never picked up a bass in my life. But I just, you know, I made the call at the moment. I'm not sure what made me do it. But I raised my hand and I said, yeah, I know how to play the bass. And they said, okay, great. We're going to meet next week and start practicing. Mm-hmm. And so I suddenly realized I have about a week to figure out what this instrument is. How do I play it? So every night I was going to the music room, picked it up, learned it. I was definitely not good enough or not very good. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I think my bandmates figured it out, but you know, it was that outrageous moment to say, I want to be part of this. I'm just going to assume I can teach myself or figure it out in the next one week. And I don't look back and regret it, fortunately, because it forced me to learn something. So I don't want the lesson for people to be, you know, they often say, fake it till you make it, or just, you know, if you, you know, go with it and things will come. I think it's that self, it was a little bit more of that self-belief, but as you look back, it was, it was an outrageous thing to do is just say, yeah, sure, I can play this in a band at a show and you know I was fortunately able to make it work. Amazing. Well done. So my next question is that if you had a tattoo yeah. on your arm, yeah. which is a message to yourself, yeah. what would it be? I think this is probably counter to what most people expect I would say, but I would probably say there's a beauty in imperfection. And it links back to what I said about, you know, the role model. But I think many of us grew up thinking the goal is to chase perfection in everything you do, et cetera. And I think there's a, there's a beauty and imperfection and being self-aware about your flaws and what, and what, what your shortcomings are and being okay with those while trying to strive, you know, I'm an incredibly ambitious person. I want to strive to be better, but there's a beauty in, in imperfection. And I think knowing that and reminding yourself of that, uh, makes you, makes you a stronger person. Okay. I should have time for just a couple more questions. Yeah. Uh, my next question is that if you had the same pay, 
that you get as a professional yeah. with PNG. Yeah. Um, would you pursue another career? So I thought about this and I, I, my immediate instinct was to say, I'm happy with what I do. Mm. So that again, makes me feel very fortunate that I, I love my industry. I love my company. I love my peers. I'm excited to go to work every morning. And so my immediate answer would be probably no. Mm. I think if I, if I did have the opportunity to make the same amount of money and do something else, I would love to be able to spend more time within the sports journalism space, within the podcasting space to do a little more of that. But in general, I'm, I'm very happy with that. Wonderful. Mm. So my last question to you, you know, There'd be thousands of people who will watch you and me speak and listen to us as well. Yeah. What would your advice be to a young individual um, who's starting out on their corporate journey? Yeah. Um, you know, they look up to you and say, look at everything that he's achieved. Yeah. What would your advice be to them? Yeah, probably my single biggest advice there is we often get caught up and hung up in measuring success or measuring progress versus others. Mm. And probably the single biggest thing I would encourage people to do is it's important to benchmark versus others. You want to be the best. You want to be you know, doing well relative to others. But it's equally important to benchmark success mm. and progress versus yourself. So as you think about you know, any point you're at in life, I'm 25. Here's what other 25-year-olds are doing. That's one way to look at it and, it, and it's important, but it's probably more important to say, hey, versus where I was at age 23, here's where I've come. Okay. And so remembering that you know, success and progress is not just versus the other people, uh, it's versus yourself and constantly growing because everybody's path is incredibly different. There are no two leaders. I know any industry, any company, even within p g there are no two leaders who have the exact same path. And so if you get hung up on benchmarking versus what everybody else is doing, you lose sight of the progress you've made and the journey you're taking. So that's probably my one advice is keep benchmarking against where you were. Uh, so everything's relative. Everything's relative, but also be okay that it's relative to yourself. Yeah. Not just relative to others. Ashwin, thank you very much. It's been such a pleasure speaking to you. Thank and good you. luck. Thank you for having me on the bench. Thank you for listening to the Brand Called You podcast. Be sure to visit tbcy.in to join the conversation, access show notes, and discover fantastic bonus content. You can follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Simply search for The Brand Called You. Thank you, and see you next week.